don't care if you call it wrestling. I don't care if you call it sports entertainment. Whatever WWE was on this week, keep supplying them. We need more of it. More, more, more! Because this week's SmackDown, top to bottom, is the best I can remember in a long time to those that are going to opine that this was because of AEW and some of their recent things. No doubt that probably played a part. May have also been the company just trying to, you know, get some momentum for themselves. Also thinking about, hey, we're in MSG. We've got to treat this a little differently. This is the true home stomping grounds of stomping grounds. All of that probably played a role. But when you look at this show, kind of narrow the scope a little bit of who you're going to focus on, focus on the really key important things and do it in the key right ways. And man, it is amazing how good things can be. Not every week is going to be like this, nor is it realistic to ever expect it. But you want more shows like this. For those of you that aren't old enough to remember this type of show, to a certain degree, not entirely, and obviously stylistically much different. If you're wondering what wrestling was like back during the Monday Night Wars, the Attitude Era time frame, it was shows like this, and you got those consistently. The matches had a purpose of some kind, one way or another. The action was good. You were doing interesting things with interesting characters for the most part, with Good storytelling, plot twist, surprises, like felt like a big event, like you couldn't miss it, didn't want to miss it, would mock others because they did miss it. Like this, this, yes, all the fucking way. Like it's a big show, so you got to break out the big dog to start, obviously. You're breaking out the bloodline. Perfect faction name for this group. And it's because whatever our tribal chief, chief touches turns to gold. Gold, I'll tell you. But Roman Reigns coming out and talking about he runs WWE. He runs Madison Square Garden. And then Brock coming out. Like, the Bloodline shirts are fucking awesome. Roman looked like a million bucks here. The Usos looked freaking great standing in the ring. Paul Heyman looked at his smarmy, slimy vest. Brock Lesnar... Rocking his fucking bear looking gimmick. I just got out of the blue oyster. And by God, I'm ready to slam some men together. Yeah, slam some man meat. Like everything about this opening segment fucking worked. Brock saying, oh, Paul, how come you didn't tell Roman I was going to be there? Like that type of shit. Like now you've added a whole layer. That was the theme that played out throughout the night of uh, Paul Heyman and what he knew and what's going on. And. Man, like, this shit was fantastic. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And then they fouled that up with one of those, it seems weird and odd and random, but whoever came up with this idea deserves all of the credit in the world. Because, my God, this crowd had heat for this shit. And it came across so well on TV, especially if you grasp what was going on. Sami Zayn rocking the Kevin Knox New York Knicks jersey. You're in Madison Square Garden, the home of the Knicks. And talking about, you know, somebody that knows something about winning and being successful in Madison Square Garden. The Atlanta Hawks own Trey Young! Oh, man! <laughs> oh, ho, 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 ho. That MSG crowd was pissed. Pissed, I say. See, this random type of shit, this creative, different type of shit. You bring out Trey Young, he gets involved, so you can let the fans boo, and then when he gets sent to the back, you don't have to involve him in a damn match. The crowd is fucking popping because he's getting kicked out. They freaking loved it. It's a shame that Reggie Miller works for TNT and they would have never allowed it. But imagine bringing in the, uh, Reggie Miller into the garden. And he comes out and he does this to the crowd. Oh, shit. I almost wish this would be the gimmick for Sami Zayn every week. This was fucking fantastic. And you can tell the WWE clearly cared this week. <laughs> Fucked 
Dolph Ziggler because that's the obligatory thing to do, and then we move on for that piece of crap. The end of this tag match, though, once Big E got the win, he got him in the ring, and he gave him some mic time, and this was better. Like, this is where you look at a Big E and you say, you know what? You, know, you can you can blend a little bit of your personality in there, but you tone it down just a little bit. You get a little more serious. Get believable. Get credibility behind you. Like, this worked. You've got until WrestleMania, really, to get him ready for that spot. Get him ready with stuff like this. This came across well tonight. This was that promo, that interview, where I looked at him and said, you know what? I potentially see a future world champion. That, that was good stuff. The, the, the most cringy thing tonight on this show, by a million miles, was this Bianca Belair and Becky Lynch contract signing. I don't know what the fuck this was supposed to be with Cringy Lynch and her frickin' rip-off Connor gimmick. Boy, I'm you to apologize to absolutely nobody. Like, everybody's talking about Becky Lynch and her coat, you know, being made from Clifford the Red Dog. She killed him. I think of it as being made of 100% dead almos. And if you get that reference, <laughs> for me to poop on. <laughs> this coat is made from 100% real dead Elmos. <laughs> when Becky was talking about, you know, how long Bianca lasts, like, Bianca should have fired back with something very simple. She should talk about how Becky's used to things lasting under 30 seconds. Ask Seth Rollins. Like, bam, done. It's over. You had that Becky stammering and stuttering like she was frickin' Ruby Soho with a mic in front of her. Yeah, all these things that Becky Lynch was doing, like you're actually kind of getting the crowd behind her as a heel, like they're, they're embracing this, but it almost feels like you did kind of undercut the heat a little bit, a lot, by just having her sign the damn contract there. Why did you do that? And then all this shit that Bianca was having said to her by Becky Lynch, all that other crap doesn't piss her off. But now the contract gets thrown at her and she closes it and now she's pissed off. Yeah, this was not good. Bianca looked fucking amazing. Oh, God damn. You take, lady, take a little pride in how she looks like a Bianca does and it shows and it comes across. Like she looks like a star. Unfortunately, she's one of the cringiest when she's on the microphone, especially in this role. Like... Is weird because she's both authentic and it sounds really fake. Like you can tell she's being who she really is, but it just doesn't land and it doesn't connect. Becky Lynch, from a skill standpoint, does not do a good job portraying a villain. She just doesn't. You know, it worked here in this moment with this crowd and based off of what they did. So I guess in that sense they say it worked. But now you've already got the match tied up. Like it killed some of the heat. Yeah, it was it was a bad segment. It was bad. It was one bad thing on this show. But at least I got Becky Lynch's, or excuse me, Cringy Lynch's 100% Dead Elmo's coat to make fun of in perpetuity. I must have went shopping with her husband, and I bet she got it done in under 30 seconds. Ha <laughs> ha! Edge versus Seth Rollins. I swear, Edge looks to be damn near in as good of shape as he's ever been. Like, he is fantastic. What, 48 years old? Like, this dude is fucking legit. Like, you could talk about age or this and that, but when a dude keeps himself in this type of shape and still can go like this from a physical standpoint, can still tell the types of stories that he can, then there's no problem with putting him in the top spot. I want to be clear with that. Because this, to me, was like an example of they were trying to throw everything they could at this show. You could clear, clearly see they picked and choose who they wanted to feature. They didn't waste time on people that didn't matter. They focused on the ones that did, stuck with the key stuff, and it really, really worked. But this match between him and Seth was outstanding. Probably on the same level of what they did at SummerSlam. And you got to see it on network TV. And unlike what happened with the opening segment, you don't have any profanity here, so you're not going to sit there and have network TV censoring it where you get this big, long, awkward pause when you're watching it at home. It was just weird, but it's probably the nature of the beast when you're talking about network TV. you got to deal with FCC bullshit, etc., but these guys have really good chemistry together. The storytelling dynamics are great. Like, this is one of these matches that if you're into the in-ring action, it worked for you. If you're into the character storytelling, it worked for you. It just worked. And then even afterwards, like, 
having Seth Rollins get interviewed backstage and he's kind of like almost like having it feels like an out of body experience and he doesn't really know he just like kind of snapped and he's starting to come back to reality like that was a really good touch and most importantly of all you've set up a third match wonderful this match was fantastic and then the tag team championship match between the Street Profits and the Usos like this feels like a match that should be main eventing a SmackDown You've got two interesting, compelling tag teams that the fans clearly care about. One working one side of the fence, the other one working the other side of the fence. And you sit there and you say to yourself, okay, like, let's get down for the crown. And they did. This match was really damn good. And then the tribal chief does what he does. And that is, of course, having a bailout main event, Jay, and .205 Jimmy one more time, which... That worked too. He's sitting there and submitting Montez Ford. If you wanted to make something a little more realistic, why not have Bianca come out and try to sit there and say something to Roman? Just saying. But then you get the big surprise at the end of the night, which was teased at the end of SmackDown last week when the lights flickered and Roman kind of acknowledged it. Again, that storytelling element, just nailing that type of stuff. It's the fucking demon. And you got to see the two things that are really cool about Finn Balor. His entrance and the demon body paint. Like, that shit's fantastic. Don't ever let anybody tell you that that's not good, or that's stupid, or that's dumb, because it's not. Anybody who thinks it is may be dumb. The problem is, is once you get past that, what else do you have? Like, it's his alter ego, but he doesn't do anything different. You do all these great theatrics, and this is what... WWE is supposed to be, if you're thinking about it like sports entertainment, it's supposed to be spectacle, it's supposed to be theater. Like, him coming through the smoke, crawling through the smoke, and then do 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 do, and the fans go nuts, like, that's what wrestling's supposed to fucking be, that's awesome. And then he walks down and you're like, yeah, he's supposed to be scared of this dude that he's several inches taller than, and probably 80, 90 pounds bigger than, body paint or not, that's not believable. And again, distracting a little bit from the story between Roman and Brock. But I guess we got to deal with it. You know, they featured Roman prominently on the show. That made it good. So that pleased fans like me. Fans that are into some of the match action certainly loved Edge versus Seth Rollins. Probably loved the main event. And they certainly loved seeing the Demon make his appearance tonight. Like, it doesn't have to be so hard. And like I said, I realize not every week can be like this. But this was one of these instances where SmackDown was so good, I felt a little spent to the point like I was going to have trouble paying attention to Rampage, no matter what they did. And that was only for an hour. Like, damn. It felt good on a Friday night after a long week of work and school and everything else to sit there and be able to watch a show like this for two hours and feel legitimately entertained. Not trying to find things just to poke fun at. Not trying to manufacture shit. None of that stuff. Like just legitimately entertained. This was a lot of fun. And I think that's a pretty general consensus from those of us who watched this show on Friday night. 